Okay. Um, so before we get started, some of you know me, some of you don't. Um, but one thing about me is I love shoes. And <laughs> hi, Mike. Here's my shoe story. You came just in time. Um, I went and got shoes just for this, right? <laughs> but how am I going to show them? So, so I wanted to show everyone what I would be wearing if I was in Minneapolis today, because they're just so spectacular, right? So anyway, that's my shoe story, and that's why they're back there. So yeah, great choice. <laughs> oh, thanks, Mike. He says he's seen the shoes. It's time for him to leave. <laughs> okay, so I I am going to get started because my uh, I have a lot of content because I'm. I just want to share everything with everyone because I'm so passionate about the topic. Um, and I'm always, I always run out of time. So I'm just going to start sharing. Um, but it's kind of weird, right? I'm look, looking around for the red button, you know, Kevin's red button. Um, I do want to preface my talk with there are some accessibility issues with this presentation. Um, I do have images on my slides. Most are decorative. If um, but if they do have supporting information, I'll be sure to describe them. And um, just so those people who can't see them for whatever reason um, get that supporting information. And then also there's this really neat feature I like to share that Google Slides has captioning. And since there's no live captioning here on this in this room, um, I wanted to turn on captioning and show you where they are. If you go right here and you hit the caption button, um, Google Slides will start captioning for you. Um, and that feature helps different people for different reasons. And I'll talk about that as um, more in, in depth uh, later in the presentation. I miss Barack. Um, he says, we're at a time in our country's history that inclusive language is better than exclusive language. Um, I also, before I really get in depth with this presentation, I want to acknowledge um, the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Ohlone lands, um, specifically the Mutsun region where I live. Um, that's where I'm presenting today in Hollister, California in San Benito County. Um, and this acknowledgement really is to demonstrate a commitment um, to help work out um, and dismantle the ongoing legacies of colonialism. And if you want to ask me about that, you're welcome to. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Amy June. That's one word, not Amy, but Amy June. And for you programmers out there, that's title camel case. Um, I use the pronouns she and her. And I am the open source community ambassador and quality assurance engineer for Canopy Studios. Um, and I want to give you a little bit of my background um, to help you understand um, where I'm coming from with the things I talk about. Um, along with Carrie Fisher from DeQ and Donna Bungard from Canopy, I help organize a monthly chat called Ally Talks, A11YTLKS. It's a virtual online meetup um, where we have speakers and guests discuss um, all things accessibility. And then um, I'm a hospice nurse by trade. Um, so I understand how some users of technology struggle um, with small tasks, even email, because um, I believe that all information should be accessible. And then a little bit about me in the community. I mentor and train at various camps um, all over the country, and I help on the um, community working groups, uh, community health team. I work with Canopy. They bring me here today. Um, we are an open source website agency. Um, we specialize in data-driven intelligence solutions. We design, build, and support websites for clients who want to make a positive impact because that's really important. Um, the Expo Hall is still open, so if you want to go over there and um, go to the booth, you have a chance to win a gift card for a Lego set. That's pretty exciting. And we're also hiring. And um, if you want more details about jobs that we have out there, you can find more on our website. So who are you? Um, you can introduce yourselves in the chat window. I'm not watching the chat window, but everyone can see who else is here. Um, we're project managers. Maybe you work in sales. You run the human resources department. You're bloggers. You're marketers. You drive social media trends. You're the communicators, right? And you're allies. So what's inclusion? 
Um, inclusion can mean different things to different people. Um, there's inclusion on a personal level. There's inclusion on a community level. And there's inclusion on a global level. Um, and what does it mean to have an inclusive content strategy? So I want to talk a little bit about the words diversity and inclusion. Um, sometimes these words are lumped together and they're assumed to be the same thing, but that's not the case. Um, in the workplace, diversity equals representation um, because without inclusion, uh, the connections that attract all those various types of talent and encourage their participation and the things that um, foster creativity and lead to business growth just won't happen. Diversity is more focused on tracking characteristics and identities. It's more of an invitation um, for people who have previously been excluded based on gender or sexual orientation, ability, age, um, ethnicity, or any other characteristic that people are labeled with. Um, on the slide, I say that it refers to the vast array of human differences, um, whereas inclusion refers to the intent of the individuals or systems to actively include and support this vast array of differences. Um, inclusion is about welcoming and embracing everyone, um, embracing that diversity because of all of those benefits it brings, right? Um, it amplifies marginalized voices and ideas. Um, it really comes down to that inclusion exercises diversity. It's a, it's a conversation that's deepened by diversity. And this is an iteration of a talk I've been giving for, for a while now. Um, and I, I wanted to change it up a little bit for DrupalCon. I wanted to change some of my quotes, but I couldn't change this one because it just, it just explains things so well. Verna Myers, um, she's a public speaker. She says that diversity is being um, invited to the party where inclusion is being asked to dance. Um, so again, that means that diversity alone doesn't drive that inclusion. Um, and when you don't have that inclusion, there's often that diversity backlash. And for underrepresented communities, it's the difference between being um, tolerated and being accepted and celebrated for your parts. And, you know, this is a talk about uh, content. So what does it mean to have meaningful content? Um, who are our readers? Um, of course, we have target audiences for some of our content, but really most copy and content should be for everyone and everyone should be able to access that. And having that meaningful content means that we can't make assumptions. Um, this is something I'm passionate about because assumptions create barriers. Um, we shouldn't assume a person's political stance. Uh, we shouldn't assume their socioeconomic class. We shouldn't assume abilities. Um, remember, as we get older, everyone becomes a little bit more disabled. Uh, our hearing and sight can deteriorate over time. And then think of um, temporary or situational disabilities. And I tell this story, um, many of you know that I've had a broken arm in the past. And um, I use a I use a computer for my daily work and using a mouse was difficult. And so I learned keyboard navigation really quick and I learned how inaccessible a lot of things were just having that broken arm. But there's also thinking of the user on a plane that forgot their headphones um, and they want to use closed captioning. People could be recovering from Lasix. They could be using the smartphone or a tablet outside in the bright sunshine. And then um, as humans, we need to um, be sure that we understand that not every uh, not every disability can be seen. Um, there's fatigue, there's learning differences, there's mental health disorders, there's debilitating pain, as well as those hearing and vision impairments that a lot of people think of. Um, more common assumptions that people make are ones around um, gender identity, um, sexuality, and pronouns. Um, and remember that gender sex and sexual identity are all different things. Um, so be aware of the language we use surrounding the use of pronouns. Um, and this is something I just learned in the last year is, you know what? <clears throat> They're not a person's preferred pronouns. They're just 
people's pronouns, period. Um, so if you want to ask me questions about that after the talk, I have lots of words to say that. But um, using that word preferred really alienates some people. Um, so inclusive language. Um, let's take a look at inclusive language. Increasing the inclusivity of our language um, means striving to understand the ways that language often unconsciously makes assumptions about people. Um, and I'm going to say this a bunch of times to iterate it through my, my talk. Um, it can unintentionally, and it's not deliberate all the time, it's usually unintentional, but it can reinforce those dominant norms around gender, sexual orientation, ability, disability, race, age, and all of those other things that people can be labeled with. Um, so just think about that. Um, our words can unintentionally reinforce dominant norms. Ableist language. Um, me working in um, the healthcare industry for years, I'm very sensitive to this. Um, lots of my friends uh, have different uh, skills and different abilities. Um, and ableist language is any word or phrase that basically devalues people who live with disabilities, um, often inadvertent. Um, ableist language suggests that people with disabilities are abnormal. Um, so use people first language. Um, and I'm, I have a, a whole slide coming up where I talk about this. I'm not going to go through every example, but I'll go through a couple. We want to make sure that we use people first language. So use people with disability instead of the disabled. But saying that, we want to be sure that we use the language that people prefer. Um, even the word disability is no longer universally accepted. We should use um, person-centered language, like I said. Um, we should avoid um, negative or demeaning language for people who live with disabilities. Um, for example, people living with AIDS rather than AIDS victims. Um, people who use wheelchairs rather than invalid or confined or wheelchair bound. Um, uh, it's become all too common to use descriptive words like crazy, dumb, manic, or lame in the workplace, or, you know, even in personal conversations. Um, using terms like this might seem harmless, like crazy, but giving that word, that negative value, um, can marginalize some folks. Um, like I said, there's a lot on this slide, um, so I'm not going to go over them, but OCD is one I hear a lot from folks in our community. Um, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder is a, is a illness that means so much more than just a knack for being organized. It's an obstacle for some folks. Um, they struggle through it every day. There's always a replacement, so use words like clean or organized instead. And then another aspect of inclusive language is being sure that our words are gender neutral. Um, use words that encompass all genders rather than only two, because there aren't just two genders. So use words that encompass all genders. And this can um, apply to nouns, titles and names, and pronouns. Um, so here's another list. I'm not going to use all of them, but I'm going to go through some that I hear a lot. Um, it's simply not OK to use gendered introductions for a diverse group of individuals. Um, the words may seem benign, but if someone is annoyed when they hear, hey, guys, we hear that a lot, don't we? Hey, guys, um, then the polite thing to do is to call them something else. Um, it's a language shift. Um, use folks or people rather than hey guys. Uh, me and my friends have taken to correcting ourselves when we say it to say hey party people. That way it calls attention to among our group when we use the word guys and it's kind of fun. Um, but you know using words like staffed rather than manned, you know man the booth, um, go between rather than middlemen. Um, and then everyone instead of 
women and men, uh, children instead of boys and girls, siblings or kindred instead of brothers and sisters. Um, so our language is littered with symbolism of white um, as a positive and black as a negative. Um, so there's a lot of unintentional slurs that are littered through our language as well. Um, cultural racism, um, you know, using terms like culturally deprived or economically disadvantaged or uh, what's the other one, um, underdeveloped. Those are all words that kind of warp the truth and frame sort of a sense of superiority. Um, so be mindful when you use that kind of language. And then here's another list. And in the PDF that I thought, each of these has a link to it. But if you go to that GitHub repository, there's links in there um, because I'm not going to go over all of these because um, I just want to like frame a couple of them. Uh, let's eliminate using the word colored when we're describing um, people of color. That's more of a widely accepted umbrella term that includes any um, non-white person, people of color. Um, gypped, I was guilty of this until a few years ago, comes from the word gypsy, which refers to Romanian people who are often um, unfairly and uncharacter uh, or characterized as um, swindlers. Um, ghetto is suspected to derive from the Italian word for waste. Um, and that dates back to uh, the concentration camps of World War II. Um, but in the last decade, couple decades, um, it's been used to marginalize communities that have forced, uh, uh, it's been used to label the communities in which under, uh, which marginalized communities were forced to inhabit due to perhaps like socioeconomic um, disadvantage. So classism and racism come into the picture when you call a place or a person ghetto. Um, and then there's the idea of privilege when it comes to our language. Um, we want to use language that doesn't assume a certain level of education. Uh, for example, we shouldn't assume that everyone has grade graduated from high school or um, college especially in our industry, you know, we, we uh, see that a lot of uh, job descriptions will call for a, for a degree when we don't really need it. Um, we can't make the assumption that everyone will go to college after high school either. Um, we don't want to use language that um, assumes a certain level of financial means or a certain sort of vocation. Um, we can't assume that everyone in the room is employed or has a stable living condition or can even afford to meet their basic needs. Um, maybe they work the first shift. Um, using phrases like real job and honest living can really be problematic um, uh, by perpetuating discriminating against um, certain sects of our labor, labor force, right? And as the internet opens up um, to more people, we enter this realm of having a world stage. So look, global DrupalCon. Um, and English as a second language can be a privilege or a situational privilege. So this is something to keep in mind when we think about folks who consume our content as well. And that is one of the reasons not, a lot, not alone with um, people who might not be able to hear me of why I use captions, because some people um, can parse that a little bit better when it's written. And part of inclusion really is accessibility um, because it's everyone, right? how do we embrace accessibility? Um, first, we have to understand what it means. Um, and in the context I'm going to talk about today, it's about rich, engaging content that is accessible to everyone. Oh, you folks are reading about Tipping Point. Yeah, that one was a new one to me. Um, Temple Grandin, um, great person. Um, she is the American professor of animal science at Colorado State University. She's a consultant to the livestock in industry on um, animal, be animal behavior, and she's um, an autistic uh, spokesperson. She was really one of the first individuals to speak out and publicly share uh, her insights from her personal experience of autism. And I love this quote, too, and I keep it in all my accessibility talks, um, because differences aren't quantifiable. And she says, I'm different, not less. So being accessible means everyone can readily access what you're offering. Um, 
I'm going to be talking specifically about content today, but that means services and venues. It means everything. I'm going to say that again. It means everyone can readily access what you're offering. And inclusion is not giving special privileges. It's about making sure that those barriers are gone, that those barriers are removed, right? So what makes our content accessible? There's four broad parameters that we must consider um, when making our content accessible. And I'm going to take a drink first. So we want to be sure that we make our content easy to see, that we're accommodating folks' visual needs. We want to make sure that people can interact with our content so we accommodate motor needs. Um, we want to make sure that it's easy to hear or there's replacements so we accommodate auditory needs. And then we want to make sure that we make things easy to understand so we accommodate cognitive needs as well. We want to make the experience as, a, as equivalent as possible regardless of anything that we can't control. And this comes to like computer size, tablet size, phone operating system, all of those things. So let's look at some numbers. Um, accessible code may be imperative for inclusion, but all the code in the world doesn't do any good if folks can't access the content. So let's look at some numbers. Accessibility is essential for developers and organizations that want to create those tools and those high quality websites. Um, we don't want to exclude anyone from using our products and services. And according to the Center for uh, Disease Control, 26% of Americans um, live with a disability. That's one in four people. And this stat is old for my slide deck. Um, this was probably written about a year and a half ago. And that was 61 million people a year and a half ago. DeQ uh, reported, um, uh, did a report that said that 70% of sites are inaccessible and retailers are estimated to lose 6.9 billion annually to accessible competitors. Okay, so it's, it's all right to admit that your past self wasn't equipped with the sufficient knowledge, right? The, the thing to do now is to move forward. And we as content authors and designers and coders and basically humans um, need to go beyond that empathy um, to include every community as participants in our content strategy solutions, right? Um, everyone's hungry to be part of the process um, in the creation of our world. Um, every, it's really not fair. Well, that isn't the right way to say it. Um, people want to be seen as equal participants and not afterthoughts. I'm going to say that again, I think. Um, people want to be seen as equal participants and not afterthoughts. So I'm going to talk about some common pieces of copy. And this isn't everything. These are just some things that we see in our industry. Um, student admission pages. There are some folks here I saw in the chat from the high ed world. So let's look at student admission pages. Um, do your pages represent your school? Stereotype threat. That refers to the risk of confirming uh, negative stereotypes about a person's racial, ethnic, um, gender, or cultural group. Um, tokenism. Tokenism simply gives the illusion of equality without really having it. Um, according to Miriam Webster, um, it's the practice of doing something such as hiring a person um, who belongs to a minority group only to prevent criticism and give the appearance that people are uh, being treated fairly. Um, I want to stress that word, the appearance that people are uh, being treated fairly. Um, so with that tokenism, make sure that your imagery aligns with your population um, and only make reference to personal attributes or characteristics to a people when it's relative. There's no reason to mention anything about a person if it, if it doesn't provide a specific context. Um, hiring practices, uh, let's go back to that people first aspect. Um, words sometimes in tech job descriptions can skew towards more uh, a gendered interpretation. 
and really sort of discourage people from applying. So we want to make sure that we avoid gendered language and male oriented titles like hacker or ninja. Again, these seem benign, but they're not. Um, using insider language in your job ad makes it easier for applicants to feel out like outsiders and keep them from applying. So keep your language simple and straightforward and don't expect people to know every aspect of your company's culture before having the chance to like really experience it. Um, you can bring a little compassion to your job ads by thinking about the perks and benefits that matter the most to different um, types of people. Um, you can include financial and work-life offerings, things like parental leave um, even. Um, if you have an office, which I hope most of you don't these days, but when we're back in offices, you know, is there a quiet space for our uh, neuro diverse friends, you know, someplace where they can take a break? Um, uh, do we uh, accommodate for people's uh, disabilities? You know, are your doors wide enough for wheelchairs? And do we, do you offer benefits that cover um, uh, domestic partners? Um, Culture fit. This is a weird one. Um, the likelihood that a job will be able to conform and adapt to the core values and collective behaviors that make up a company, um, that's weird. Uh, companies are discovering that looking for that cultural fit doesn't really promote inclusion. Um, so folks are changing the language a little bit, you know, to have values align, so like culture ads. Um, the words in your EEO, your Equal Employment Opportunity Statement, um, which often ap ap appear in our job postings, um, are often the words that candidates measure us by, right? But those EEO statements are only meaningful if they reflect the truth. Um, going back to that tokenism, you know, we really want to promote what we believe in and what we practice. Um, So code bases and archives, um, and I'm just going to kind of gloss through these. Um, and I see Drupal doing this, and um, we're stripping our code bases and our archives and our documentation of harmful language. Um, you know, uh, words like whitelist and blacklist are being replaced by allowed and denied. Um, the term master and servant are being replaced by parent and child. Um, pronouns. Um, we haven't seen pronouns in a while in our documentation, which is great, but instead of using he or she, we're using they or the user. Um, and I want to slip back into the accessibility and I want to go beyond alternative text. Um, that's what a lot of folks think about when they think of accessibility. Um, how do we make sure that our content is accessible and inclusive for everybody? Um, one thing we can do is provide uh, structure to our pages, you know, um, have sections and nested heading orders, making sure our pages are predictable and consistent from page to page so people know how to navigate your site. Um, and really that comes down to when you first build your site. We don't want things to be afterthoughts. Um, coming down to designing our site. So making sure our color contrast is good, our font sizes are good, your links are distinguishable. Just underline your links, people, who cares? Um, but if you can't handle underlining your links, um, make sure that there's two uh, distinctions um, on the that makes them different from everything else on the page, not just color. Make them bold, italicized, do anything. Readability, we want to write at the ninth grade reading level, avoiding long sentences, two to three um, sentences per paragraph and keeping our sentences short. We want to use plain language, avoiding jargon. I saw someone um, uh, say something about, uh, I think, readability.gov in the chat. Um, you know, use plain language, don't use jargon. Um, bullets and number lists can break up your content. Um, and then our imagery. Uh, and I'll talk about this in the next slide, providing captions and subtitles and providing text alternatives. So be sure that your images are accessible. Provide captions that are succinct and to the point. Provide alternative text. Even for events like presentation, describe the images or video as needed. Um, 
This is helpful for folks who have poor internet connections or folks who have images turned off in their browser. Describe the pictures. Ensure that the readers aren't missing out um, on any of the content. Um, and the subtitles. Subtitles are lines of text, and you can see that, well, these are captions, but subtitles are lines of text um, that appear on uh, or basically the speech on the screen. Um, captions can either be opened or closed. Open captions are always in view and cannot be turned off, whereas closed captions can be turned on and off by the viewer. Uh, captioning has universal design benefits for people other than those with hearing impairments. Um, you know, people who use, uh, whose language might not be, or whose primary language might not be English, and they can read this um, uh, to help uh, parse the language a little bit better. And then again, people in situational things, like people in busy uh, airports or health clubs and sports bars. And I'm just gonna fly through this. Um, I wanna talk about presentations. Um, how do we make our presentations um, uh, more accessible? We want to make sure that they're easy to see, so we address those visual needs. We want to make sure that the folks in the back of the room, not necessarily here, they want to see the show too, so use large fonts and color contrast. Again, describe those images and videos. Um, make it easy to hear. Um, address those auditory needs. Make transcripts and captions available, um, and I'll talk about these in the next slide. Uh, some venues include live captioning. Um, we didn't have that in all the rooms here, so that's why I have the captioning on here. And what I do for my presentations is I leave the bottom section of my slides empty for when the closed captionings go on. That way that closed captioning doesn't um, uh, skew any of the content. Um, we want to make sure that we address uh, visually induced motion sickness, VIMS. Um, so we want to avoid uh, rapid slide transitions, flashing lights, animations. Um, animated backgrounds and parallax can be problematic. GIFs um, can be a distraction, especially when the slide is left, for any, uh, left on for any amount of time. Um, because some types of rapid motions and patterns can induce seizures. And then, um, we want to address those cognitive needs as well. Dyslexia is an example. You want to avoid those like big blocks of text on our slides. Um, break up that content, much as we do on the web pages with bullet points. Um, make it easy to read digestible chunks. And use friendly fonts. Um, for more information, um, my friend Carrie Fisher, uh, she wrote the Ally Style Guide. That's A11Y Style Guide. Carrie Fisher, you can look that up on the internet. It's a great guide for making everything accessible. So there's some other gotchas, um, acronyms. In general, acronyms and abbreviations can muddle clarity. Um, and screen readers don't recognize them. They generally read them as if they were all one word. Um, for unusual abbreviations and acronyms, provide a key with their meaning um, using a period between letters and an acronym can help uh, screen readers parse them. Um, when writing alt tags with acronyms, um, add spaces between the characters sometimes. Um, there's the HTML tag um, abbreviate. Um, the acronym tag was actually deprecated in HTML5. So let's look at BLM. Um, for years, BLM meant Bureau of Land Management, but now it can mean something different. It can mean Black Lives Matter. So making sure that we provide a key to what our acronyms mean really helps people um, uh, with the value and the meaning. Uh, numerems are number-based words. Um, that's one example where the letters between the first and the last are replaced. Accessibility is a, as a numerum. You've got the A and the Y and the 11 letters that it replaces, A11Y. Um, in our industry, we use internationalization a lot, I18N. And we do that for two reasons, because of the S and the Z factor, the different spellings. Um, form fields can leave people behind. Um, think about the gender field. Um, why the hell are there only two choices these days? I mean, when I see that, I like exit websites now. Again, why are there only two choices? Um, 
name fields. Um, some don't allow special characters. Some of us have hyphenated names and then some of us have longer names. So be mindful of having that maximum character count in their name fields. So great, right? Your website's contents inclusive, right? It is, right? Did we remember everything? Let's look at social media. Um, back in 2017, WebAIM conducted a survey of screen readers. Um, of almost 1,800 screen readers uh, users, only 88% or 88 of those users used a screen reader on their mobile phone or tablet or handheld device. Um, but only 54% of those people found social media somewhat accessible. And all of us live with these things, right? They're in our hands all the time. This is how a lot of higher eds communicate with our students. This is how we check Slack. Um, social media is social media is there and it's not going away. Um, nearly 200 colleges faced federal civil rights investigations in 2019 on whether their uh, sites were accessible. Um, and not only higher ed folks, but everyone should, um, have standards regarding social media accessibility and work on training and communicating with staff members to take advantage of built-in accessibility tools that some of these platforms like YouTube or Facebook or LinkedIn offer. Um, hashtags, we want to use capital letters like Amy June, title camel case to break up our hashtag. This makes it easy for people to read um, and it also helps people who use assisted technology. It helps parse those words. It really comes down to readability. Um, because remember that Twitter doesn't distinguish between cases in our searches. For example, searching Black Lives Matter with all lowercase and then having the B, the L, and the M capitalized, they'll return the same results. Um, but having said that, if your hashtag is short, then lowercase is more acceptable. Links should still be described and given context on social media. People want to know where they are going. Where are you leading them? And then images. Um, you provide alternative images on your website. Provide alternative images in your social media, too. And a lot of those social media platforms have settings that allow you to do this. You just kind of have to dig in. Um, and of course, be mindful of retweeting information that's not accessible. <laughs> this is my favorite one. <laughs> this is a few years ago, you know. Um, this all lowercase, there were, people thought Cher was dead, right? Because you can read this two different ways. Now that Cher is dead or now Thatcher is dead. It really boiled down to that capitalization. Oh, hmm. Emojis and emoticons, everyone seems to love them. But you know what? Screen readers love them so much that they read every single one of them. And there's a picture up here of a tweet where every other, well, between every word is an emoticon. Can you imagine a screen reader reading that? They read every single one of them. And that can be cumbersome um, and problematic. Um, but this also applies to emoticons and um, that we place next to our handles in our Slack profiles and in our uh, email subject lines. So be aware, um, if you wanna use a lot, save them to the end, because if you have a lot um, within your text, you're gonna lose some readers because they're just gonna get frustrated and leave your page. Digital blackface refers to non-black folks claiming black identities online. Um, or to non-Black um, folks using Black people in GIFs or memes to convey their thoughts or emotions. Just as most companies wouldn't tolerate a white person taking the stage in Blackface, um, there shouldn't be any tolerance of this in online spaces as well. Um, white people using Blackface reaction in GIFs and memes is sort of dangerous because we're going back to perpetuating black stereotypes, you know, think of sassiness or anger or excitement. Um, it turns those black um, emotions into comedy for the pleasure of white people's use. So the problem lies in the ways that black individuals have been and still are exploited um, by the media for humor. So um, be aware of that. Um, 
and the more you know, right? Um, move forward. Um, but but now what? Um, if you have the privilege to change your language because you have the ability, the resources, and the cognitive ability, consider being um, becoming more aware. Well, don't just consider. I would say do it, but I'm not that sort of authoritative person. But be aware of how your everyday language can perpetuate all those ableist, gendered, and racial um, ideas and values. Um, this is a great fortune. Um, begin, the rest is easy. I pulled this out of a fortune cookie 18 years ago. I have it taped to my external monitor. Um, that first step is always the hardest, but once you just do it, it, it really does become part of your practice. Um, so set a good example for folks. Um, be an ally, uh, make your presentations, your venues, your copy accessible. Um, there's tools to help um, with content. Um, use accessibility checkers. There's many free resources. I have uh, a couple slides down. I talk about them some more. Um, many people are using their pronouns. Um, uh, they're adding them to their public profiles and email, email signatures. I see a lot of them in our chat next to people's names. Um, and that helps really um, normalize those gender identities and conversations around them, right? But with saying that, I want to talk a little bit, and I know I'm really close on time, um, the calling out culture versus calling in. Um, calling out is the idea of publicly letting someone know um, when their values or their language don't align. Um, and this behavior um, can be oppressive. Um, it often shuts people down. Um, it's a shaming culture and it's often amplified on the internet. And it makes conversations sort of horizontal. Um, they shut down conversation and it makes folks fearful of being targeted. Well, if we call in, it can take the form of like a private conversation or a DM and really be a time for education um, because folks make mistakes. Um, we're often unaware of that we caused harm um, and calling in can really be more of a productive dialogue. Um, this, the other day I saw this, um, when you correct someone's, uh, if we misuse someone's pronouns, say thank you and not sorry. I thought that was a really good language uh, addition. Um, so I want to talk about education and training a little bit because our content authors are really rad people, right? They're active participants. Um, a lot of times they're more hands-on than the front-end developers or the back-end developers in the long run. They're in that site day to day. Um, we train our coders and we train our designers um, to ensure that they understand accessibility. Well, we really need to do that with our content editors too. They can be educated in much the same fashion, right? Um, and companies really should invest in that training for our content editors. We can set up WYSIWYGs with styles that they're encouraged to use, put in tool tips, all that kind of stuff. Be trained in the importance of structure and contrast, consistent use of links and themes and images. Um, and in that GitHub repository, there's links to all of these, but there's the Hemingway, Grammarly, uh, Text.io, Gender Decoder for Job Ads, Alex, Readable. A lot of these um, uh, have checkers that uh, can check for subtle uh, linguistics around gender and um, check for passive voice, acronyms, age, ability bias. Um, and then there's some excessive, oops, there's some accessibility tools, right? Um, I really enjoy the Site Improved, Site Improved Browser extension. That's my favorite one. And then um, what is inclusion? Um, going back to that first slide, inclusion can mean different things to different people. Um, it, uh, there's inclusion on the personal level, the community level, and the global level. And in the last minute, I really want to iterate that it's doubtful you'll be called out for being too considerate. Um, not being aware of your communication is a very quick way to lose your audience. Um, they can get hurt by your message and feel excluded. So if you can choose between language and accessibility features on your website that leaves people behind versus changing that behavior that upsets no one, 
why wouldn't you choose not to upset no one? Why wouldn't you default to that neutrality, right? So language is a powerful thing. So be mindful of it um, because we don't want our language to um, perpetuate um, uh, ableist, gendered, racial values and um, uh, ideas around that. And with that, because I've taken up all of your time, I want to thank you. Um, I am Volkswagen Chick on all of the things. Um, and I see the question about sharing my slides. And if you go to the link there, canopy.com slash DrupalCon slash 2020, um, you can download slides, but they're also up here. And I'll post the link if I can get into the window. And then the GitHub repository with the supplemental links are here. And I'm so sorry that I took all, well, I'm not sorry that I took up all your time, but I'm sorry that maybe some of you had questions that I couldn't get to. Um, but again, I am, I am always available to talk. Volkswagen Chick and LinkedIn on Twitter um, and on Drupal.org. And then I'm going to close it with um, contribution day is tomorrow. Um, I help mentor people who uh, may be new to contributions or need a refresher. It's free. You don't need a ticket. So if your kids want to learn how to con contribute back to Drupal, if that uh, presentation this morning inspired you to include your kids, get them to contribution day tomorrow and we'll help them out. So thank you, everyone. And enjoy the rest of DrupalCon. <laughs>